on how we mistook the map for the territory and imprisoned ourselves in our unbearable wrongness of being of De Sarcé, Black Studies Towards the Human Project by Sylvie Winter. Quote, the idea that Western thought might be exotic if viewed from another landscape never presents itself to most Westerners. Amir Baraka, 1963. It is the opinion of many black writers, I among them, that the Western aesthetic has run its course. We advocate a cultural revolution in art and ideas. In fact, what we need is a whole new system of ideas. Larry Neal, 1971. I would like to refer you to an essay by the late Dr. Du Bois, where he says that up till the point that he really came to terms with Marx and Freud, he thought truth wins. But when he came to reflect on the set of lived experiences that he had and the notions of these two men, he saw that if one was concerned about surviving, about the good life and moving any society towards that, then you had to, to include a little something other than interesting appeal to truth in some abstract universal sense. Gerald McWhorter, 1969. The emergence of the Black Studies movement in its original thrust, before its later co-option into the mainstream of the very order of knowledge whose truth, in some abstract universal sense, it had arisen to contest, was inseparable from the parallel emergence of the black aesthetic, black arts movements, and the central reinforcing relationship that had come to exist between them. Like the late, latter two movements, the struggle to institute black studies programs and the departments in mainstream academia had also owed its momentum to the eruption of the separatist black power thrust of the civil rights movement. It too had had its precursor staged in the intellectual ferment to which the first southern integrationist phase of the civil rights movement had been given rise, as well as in the network of extracurricular institutions that had begun to call for the establishment of a black, black university, including, inter alia, institutions such as the National Association for African American Research, the Acad Black Academy of Arts and Letters, the Institute of, black, of the Black World, the New School of Afro-American Thought, the Institute of Black Studies in Los Angeles, and Forum 66 in Detroit. The struggle for what was to become the institutionalization of black studies was to be spearheaded, however, by a recently enlarged cadre of black student activists at what had been hitherto almost purely white mainstream universities all whose members have been galvanized by Stokey Carmichael's call, made in Greenwood, Mississippi, for a turning of the back on the earlier integrationist we shall overcome goal of the first phase of the civil rights movement, and for the adoption instead of a new separatist goal of black power. All three movements had been moved into action by the 1968 murder of Martin Luther King Jr., and the toll of burning inner cities and angry riots that followed in its wake. These events were particularly decisive for the Black Studies movement. The new willingness of mainstream university administrators to accede to student activists' demand for the setting up of Black Studies programs and departments was made possible by the trauma that gripped the nation. Once established, these new programs and departments functioned to enable some of the major figures of the then far more powerful and dynamic black arts and black aesthetic movements to carry some of their work into the academic mainstream, even where they, t they too, like black studies as a whole itself, were to find their original transgressive intentions diffused, their energies rechanneled as they came to be defined and in many cases actively to define themselves so, in new multicultural terms as African American studies. As such, it appeared as but one of the many diverse ethnic studies 
that had now that now served to re-verify the very thesis of liberal universalism against which the challenges of all three movements had been directed in in the first place the destinies of all three movements were in the end to differ sharply the apogee years of all three movements 1961 to 71 were to see the publication of a wide range of anthologies of poetry, theatre, fiction and critical writings, but also of the publication of three scriptural texts specific to each. Whereas 1968 saw the publication of Black Fire, an anthology of Afro-American writings, edited by Leroy Jones and Larry Neal as the definitive anthology that crystallised the the theoretical discourse and practice of the black arts movement. 1969, which saw the publication of Black Fire in a paperback version, marked the publication of the proceedings of a 1968 symposium, Black Studies in the University, which had been organised by the Black St Student Alliance at Yale University. The conference was financed by Yale administration. In 1971, the edited collection of essays by Addison Gale Jr., The Black Aesthetic, as the, the definitive text of what was to become the dominant tendency of that movement, was also published. The paradox here, however, was that in spite of the widespread popular dynamic of the black arts and black aesthetic movements, they were to disappear as if they had never been. They had been done in by several major developments. First, by the tapering off of the movement of social uprisings that had been the black civil rights movement in the context of the affirmative action programs which enabled the incorporation of the black middle classes and the socially mobile lower middle classes into the horizons of expectation, if still at a secondary level of the generic white middle classes, ending with the separation of their integration goals from the still ongoing struggles of the black lower and underclasses. At the same time, this separation had itself began to be affected in the wider national context, both by the subsiding of radical new left politics subsequent to the ending of the Vietnam War, as well as by right a rightward swing taken by society as a whole as a reaction against the tumultuous years of the 1960s. Second, their demise was hastened by the defection of the most creatively original practitioner of the black arts movement, Leroy James, Amiri Baraka, and his conversion from black power nationalism, of which the black arts and black aesthetic movements have been the spiritual arm, to the Maoist wing of Marxist-Leninism as a counter-universalism to the universalism of liberalism, which the black nationalist movement had arisen to contest, and one which he hoped would avoid the trap of cognitive and psycho-affective closure into which black arts aesthetics seemed to be fallen. Third, the rise of black feminist thought and fiction, which took its as one of its major targets, the male and macho hegemonic aspect of black nationalist aesthetic and its correlated black arts movement, even where black women had played as creative a role as men, also took its toll. Baraka's Maoist Leninist and black women's feminist defection were serious blows. The coup de grace to both the black arts and black aesthetic movements, however, was to be given by the hegemonic rise of a black, soon-to-be African-American, post-structuralist and multicultural literary theory and criticism spearheaded by Henry Louis Gates Jr. Since it was this thrust that was to displace and replace the centrality of the black aesthetic movement, redefining the latter's reformation call for an alternative aesthetic able to contest what Pierre Bordeaux was later to identify as the monopoly of humanity of our present mainstream bourgeois aesthetic with the reformist call for an alternative African-American literary canon ostensibly able to complement the Euro-American literary one.
and therefore to do for the now newly incorporated black middle classes what the Euro-American literary canon did and continues to do for the generic because white and hegemonically Euro-American middle classes. In her book, Black Women Novelists and the Nationalist Aesthetic, Madhu Dubé perceptively summarises Gates' critique of the two movements whose disappearance he was instrumental in affecting. While not refuting his, his critique, which argued inter alia that black aestheticians had been duped by the tropes of figuration of the text to black, Dubé nevertheless poses a fundamental question one that gives rise both to the title th and the thrust of my argument. While she first notes that both black aesthetics and black art movements had sought to unfix the notion of blackness from the traditional colour symbiology of the West and to challenge the Western equation of blackness with ugliness, evil, corruption and death, Gates' post-structuralist critique had now come to accuse their practitioners in Derridian terms of putting forward a metaphysical concept of blackness as presence and of having thereby, instead of displacing an essentialist notion of identity, merely installed blackness as another transcendent signified. This had then caused them to become entrapped by racial essentialism, which by its reversal of the Western definitive definition of blackness had come to depend on an absent present of western frameworks set to subvert. The fact that Gates' post-structuralist activity itself depends on the absent presence of the very same western framework that it was also ostensibly contesting did not detract from the success of his ongoing attacks on black arts, black aesthetics notions of identity in terms of post-structuralist critiques of the humanist subject. However, while admitting the effectiveness of Gates' counter-discourse counter in putting the seal on the demise of these two earlier movements, as well as Black Studies in its original 1960s conception, rather than its pacified, ethnically rechristened African-American studies that has now become, Debay then poses the following question. Why, she asks, had it been that with all its undoubted theoretical limitations, the black aesthetic rhetoric of blackness should have been so powerfully exerted an immense emotional and ideological influence, transforming an entire generation's perception of its racial identity. What had lain behind the remarkable imaginative power of the nationalist will to blackness? bristling with a sense of the possibility of blackness that had characterised the range of writings from political activists like Stokey Carmichael and Eldred Cleaver to writer-activists like Leroy James Amir Baraka, Don L. Lee, Sonia Sanchez, Jane Cortez and Nikki Giovanni, cultural nationalists like Molana Karenga, literary critics and theoreticians like Carolyn Gerald, Hoyt Fuller, Addison Gale Jr and Stephen Hen Henderson, what had been un the unique dynamic that had enabled the rhetorical energy of the black nationalist discourse so powerfully to mobilise the sign of blackness? If Debay's question can only be answered by making visible what Gates terms the absent presence of the very Western framework on whose terms blackness and its dialectical antithesis, whiteness, must be fitted into the symbiology, onto the symbiology of good and evil, the white man, Fanon writes, is seals in his whiteness, the black man in his blackness. How do we extricate ourselves? And therefore, with the attempt to unfix the sign of blackness from the sign of evil, ugliness or negation, leading to the emancipatory explosion of the level of the black psychic, psyche, then Leroy Jones and Miri Baraka's implicit proposal that Western thought, and thereby the cultural framework of his thought, needs to be exoticized, that is, viewed from another landscape by its Western, and indeed in our case, Westernized bearer subjects.
can provide us with the explanatory key to the answering of Dubey's question. In addition, recall that the black arts and black aesthetic movements were themselves historically linked to a series of other earlier movements across a range of black African diaspora, not only of the US's own Harlem Renaissance movement, but in that of the Negritude movement of Francophone West Africa and Caribbean, that of the Afro-Cuban and Afro-Antillian movements of the Hispanic Caribbean, together with the still ongoing Rastafari reggae re religio-cultural movement, an invention of the endemically jobless underclass of Jamaica, which explosively flowered at the same time as black arts, black aesthetic movements, musically interacting by means of transistor radio with the black power, musical, popular expressions of the US. The 1960s and 1970s as iconicized in the archetypal figure of a James Brown. They were also linked synchronically to the global field of the still then ongoing global anti-colonial movements as well as the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. Any attempt to exoticize Western thought by making visible its framework from another landscape links us then to a related paradox def defining all three movements. This paradox was that of their initially penetrating insights gained by the very nature of a wide range of globally subordinated peoples moving out of their westernized assigned places and calling into question what was in effect the structures of a global world system as well as the multiple social movements of other groups internal to the West, for example, feminists, gay activists, Native Americans, Chicanos, Asian Americans, students, all mounting similar challenges. Insights, therefore, into the nature of that absently present framework which mandated all their, our res respective subjections. All this led, for a brief hiatus, to the explosive, psychic, come political emancipation, not only of blacks, but also of many other non-white peoples and other groups suffering from discrimination. Yet, on the other hand, to their ultimate failure, in the wake of their political activist phase, to complete intellectually that emancipation. The literary scholar Vlad Zolgodzic perceptively identifies the nature of this paradox when he notes that although it should have been obvious at the time that the great socio-political upheavals of the late 50s and 60s, especially those grouped under the names of decolonization and liberation movements, would have had major impact on our ways of knowledge, this recognition has not been made for two reasons. The first is due to the, quote, imperfectness of our present disciplines to phenomena that fall outside of their predefined sco scope, end quote, and second, to, quote, our reluctance to see a relationship so global in reach between the epistemology of knowledge and the liberation of people, a relationship that we are not properly able to theorise, end quote. This reluctance was, therefore, not an arbitrary one, as proved by the case of the civil rights movement of the US. While, for while the earlier goals of the movement, as it began in the South, because directed against segregation and therefore couched within the terms of the universalist premise of mainstream liberal discourse, could be supported, once the move to include the North and the West, and therefore the economic apartheid issue of the institutionalized jobless and impoverished underclass, all interned in the inner city ghettos and their prison extensions, had led to the direction of the call for black power. The situation had abruptly changed. Godzic suggests that an epistemological failure emerged with respect to the relation between the claim to a black particularism as over against liberalism's counter-universalism on the one hand and over against that of Marxism as a universalism on the other. Since in the case of the latter, because based on the primacy of the issues confronting the Western working class, 
postulated as the global generic working class, this is the same way as their issue postulated as the struggle of the labour against capital had also logically come to be postulated as the generic human issue. While given that liberal humanism is itself based on the primacy of the issues of the rights of man as the defining premise which underlies both our present order of knowledge as well as the correlated mainstream aesthetics, the claim to particularism of black arts and black aesthetics as well as black studies in its original conception, these as the correlates of the claim to black power, which had itself been based on a return to an earlier recognition made in the 1920s by Marcus Garvey that, in the latter words of Barbadian novelist George, George Lamming, quote, the rights of man cannot include the rights of the Negro who has been institutionalized discursively and empirically as a different kind of creature to man, end quote. Were to find themselves met with outright hostility on the part of mainstream intellectuals, academics and aestheticians. The implacable dimensions of this hostility were to lead swiftly, as Godzich further notes, to a re whose goal was to reincorporate these moments sanitized of their original heretical dynamic into the liberal universalist mainstream. However, whilst this reincorporation was infected in the case of black studies by its reinvention as African-American studies and as such but one ethnic studies variant among a diverse range of others all contrasted with at the same time as they were integrated into the ostensible universalism of Euro-American centered mainstream scholarship. The other two movements, by their very nature of their self-definition as black particularism, which called into question the mainstream art and aesthetic together with their monopoly of humanity, were not amiable to such pacification and reincorporation. As a result, their rapid disappearance their extinction even, hastened along by Gates's neo-universalist post-structuralist critique, logically followed. For it had been precisely their original claim, as Godzich notes, to a black particularism over against the universalist premise of our present mainstream aesthetic and order of knowledge. Their claim, by Jarek McWhorter's terms, to something other than truth, in an abstract universal sense, or in Neil's terms, to a Western, to a post-Western aesthetic based on a new system of ideas, with these claims linked to the insistent revalorizing of the negative value connotations that both mainstream order of knowledge and the mainstream aesthetic placed upon all people of black African descent, thereby imposing upon us, quote, an unbearable wrongness of being, end quote that can be identified from hindsight as the dynamic that was to exert what Debay defines as the eminence of emotional influence on the entire generation's self-conception, including the kind of intellectual self-confidence that a Gates, for example, as a member of the beneficiary generation, would now come to possess. Nevertheless, the eventual defeat, both of the Black Arts black aesthetic and black arts movement, as well as the black studies in its original conception, came from the very process that had occasioned their initial triumph, that is, from the revalorization of their racial blackness, as systematically devalorized by the logic of our present mainstream order of knowledge, its arts and its aesthetic. For while this strategic inversion had functioned for a brief hiatus as a psychically emancipatory movement by its calling in question of the systematic devalorization of our physiognomic and original ethnocultural being as a population group, its eventual failure can be seen not only in the psychic mutilation of the tragic figure of Michael Jackson as expressed in his physically mutilated face, but also in the widespread use of plastic surgery not only by blacks, but also by a wide range of other non-white groups, as well as by white non-Nordic groups themselves. 
with this latter in instance providing a clue to the fact that the system systemic devalorization of racial blackness was itself only a function of another and more deeply rooted phenomenon. In fact, only the map of the real territory, the symptom of the real cause, the real issue. This is as the territory that, for example, Eldridge Cleaver, in trying in his book of essays, Soul on Ice, to account for the almost reflex instinctual nature of his attraction to white women as contrasted with the lukewarm response to, for him, the always already devalorized black woman, had glimpsed that Gwendolyn Brooks, in trying in an interview to account for the reason that successful black men also seemed instinctively to prefer lighter-skinned black women, had also charted that over some half a century earlier, W.E.B. Du Bois, in trying to come to grips with his own double consciousness, had made it difficult for him to be an American without being anti-Negro, had recognised as a new frontier with respect to the study of the still unresolved issue of what determines, indeed what structures, the nature of human consciousness, that Larry Neal had identified as antagonistic terms as the white thing within us. Yeah, this is the dilemma. All this as a territory or issues that cannot be conceptualised to, ex to exist within the terms of the vrai or regime of truth of our present order of knowledge, any more than, as Foucault had pointed out in, in the case of the 18th century classical episteme or order of knowledge that preceded our contemporary own, which was to displace, replace in during the 19th century. The concept conception of the biological life that had been imagined to exist within the terms of the Vrai regime of truth. Nevertheless, as a territory, an issue to whose empirical existence the particularity of the black experience and, therefore, of our necessarily conflictual and contradictory consciousness, together with the occasional emotional release from such a consciousness, attests, as definitively as a Geiger counter attests for the empirical presence of radioactive material. This, therefore, as a hitherto unknown territory, the territory of human consciousness and of the hybrid nature-culture laws by which it is structured, that was only to be identified in the context of both the global anti-colonial struggles as well as for the social movements internal to the West itself by the political activist and psychiatrist Franz Fanon in his book Black Skin, White Mask. Doing so from the ground of the particularity of the black experience. Quote, Reacting against the constitutionalist tendency of the late 19th century, he wrote, Freud insisted that the individual factor be taken into account through psychoanalysis. He substituted for a phylogenic theory the ontogenic perspective. It will be seen that the black man's alienation is not an individual question. Besides phylogeny and ontogeny stands sociogeny. End quote. Fanon's book was published in its original French version in 1952, one year before the publication of the Watson and Crick paper, Cracking the DNA Code, specific to the genomes of all species, including the human being. This, therefore, helped to emphasise that, given the genetically determined narcissism that would be endemic to all living beings in their species-specific modality, the fact that a black person can experience his or her physiognomic being in anti-narcissistic and self-alienating terms, as iconicized in the tragic figure of Michael Jackson, means that human beings cannot be defined in purely biogenetic terms, i.e. from the purely phylogenic come ontogenic perspective, that is, from the perspective of the purely physiological conditions of being human, i.e., phylogeny and ontogeny.
as we are now defined to be within the terms of our present liberal or biohumanist order of knowledge. Indeed, as we are induced as contemporary subjects to psycho-effectively experience ourselves to be within the terms of our biohumanist mainstream aesthetics. However, if in Fanon's terms the prognosis for the self-alienation is to be favourable, the human must be redefined in terms of a hybrid phylogeny ontogeny cum sociogeny mode of being that is empirically that it empirically is which is comprised of descriptive statements Bates in 1968 or modes of sociogeny in effect of genres or kinds of being human in whose always auto instituted and origin narratively inscribed terms we can alone experience ourselves as human. Let us note here, in passing, that the term genre means kind of human, as in the case of our present kind of human, man, which sociogenically defines itself in biocentric terms on the model of the natural organism. As the model of a, a prioristically underlies all our present disciplines, Foucault, 70, 1973, stems from the same etymological roots as the word gender. This, given that from our origins on the continent of Africa until today, gender allocations mapped onto biologically determined anatomical differences between male and female have been an indispensable function of the instituting of our genres or sociogenic kinds of being human. This latter as a process for which our species-specific genome, as uniquely defined by the co-evolution of language and the brain, have bioevolutionarily pre-programmed us. In effect, because the systematically induced nature of black self-alienation in itself, like that correlatively of homosexual self-alienation, only a function, a map, if an indispensable one, of the enacted institutionalization of our present genre of being human, man, and its governing sociogenic code, the territory, as defined in the ethnoclass or Western bourgeois biocentric descriptive statement of the human on the model of the natural organism, a model which enables it to over to overrepresent its ethnic and class specific descriptive statements of the human as if it were that of the human itself. Then, in order to contest one's function in the enacting of this specific genre of the human, one is confronted with a dilemma. As a dilemma, therefore, that is not so much a question of the essentializing or non-essentializing of one's racial blackness, as Gates argues, but rather that of the function that one cannot revalorize oneself in the terms of one's racial blackness and, therefore, of one's biological characteristics. However, inversely so, given that it is precisely the biocentric nature of the sociogenic code of our present genre of being human which imperatively calls for the devalorization of characteristics of blackness as well as of the Bantu type physiognomy in the same way as it calls dialectically for the overvalorization of the characteristics of whiteness and of the Indo-European physiognomy. This encoded value difference then came to play the same role in the enactment of our now purely secular genre of human, man, as that of the genders anatomically different between men and women had played over a millennia. If, in then supernaturally mandated terms, in the enactment of all the genres of being human that had been defining of traditional stateless order, this, therefore, led in our contemporary case to the same asymmetric disparities of power, as well as wealth, education, of life opportunities, even of mortality rates, etc., between whites and blacks, that, as feminist Sherry Ortner had pointed out in her essay, is female to male as nature is to culture, has, has, was defining of the relation between men and women 
common to all such orders. If, therefore, it is the very institutionalized production and reproduction of our present hegemonic sociogenic code as generated from its Darwinian origin narratively inscribed by a centric descriptive statement of the human on the model of a natural organism, which calls as the indispensable condition of enactment for the systemic inducing of the black self-alienation together with securing of the correlated powerlessness of the African descended population groups at all levels of our contemporary global order or system ensemble, then the explosive psychic emancipation experienced by black peoples in the US and elsewhere, as in the case of the indigenous black fellows of Australia and Melanesia, as well as among the black peoples of the Caribbean and then the still apartheid South Africa, can now be seen in terms which, which can explain both the powerful emotional influence of the three movements which arose out of socio-political black movements of the 1960s, i.e. the black aesthetics, black arts and black studies movement in its original conception, with this experience only coming to an end with their subsequent erasure and displacement. And this logically so, given that while the psychic emancipation which these movements revalorization of the characteristics of blackness had affected had been an emancipation from the psychic dictates of our present sociogenic code or genre of being human and therefore from the unbearable wrongness of being of the zerte which it imposes upon all blacks and to somewhat lesser degree and all non-white peoples as an imperative function of the enactment of such a mode of being, this emancipation had been effective at the level of the map rather than at the level of the territory. That is, therefore, at the level of the sy systemic devalorization of blackness and correlated overvalorization of whiteness, which are themselves only proximate functions of the overall devalorization of the human species that is indispensable to the encoding of our present hegemonic western bourgeois biocentric descriptive statement of the human of its mode of sociogeny in other words because the negative connotations placed upon the black population group are a function of the devalorization of the human the systemic revalorization of black people can only be fundamentally effective by means of the no less systemic revalorization of human being itself outside the necessarily devalorizing terms of biocentric descriptive statement of man overrepresented as if it were that of the human. This, therefore, as a territory of which the negative connotations imposed upon all black peoples and which serve to induce our self-alienation as well as our related institutionalized powerlessness as a population group is a function and as such a map. As correlatively are all the other isms, issues that spontaneously erupted in the US in the wake of the black social liberation movement all themselves, like the major ism of class, also specific maps to a single territory, that of the instituting of our present ethno-class or Western bourgeois genre of the human. Nevertheless, because it is the, this territory, that of the instituting of our present biocentric descriptive statement of the human on the model of natural organism that is both elaborated by our present order of knowledge and its macro discourse of liberal humanism, as well as enacted by our present mainstream aesthetic, together with the latter's monopoly on humanity, with our present order of knowledge being that foundational regime of truth, objects of knowledge, such as Fanon's auto-instituted modes of sociogeny or Bateman, Bateson's descriptive statements at the level of the psyche, psyche in effect, our genres all kinds of being human cannot be imagined to exist. Neither McWhorter's call for another truth 
and able to secure the good life for black and all other people. Nor indeed, Larry Neal's call for a post-Western aesthetic could have been incorporated, as they themselves had hoped, within the terms of our present order of knowledge and its biologically absolute conception of the human, that is, the way in which the latter re-territorialized and ethnicized African-American studies, as exemplarily elaborated and brilliantly put in place by Harvard's Henry Louis Gates Jr., would prove to be. In this context, Jones Barracker's implied call for the exoticization of Western thought in order to make this thought itself, its presuppositions, together with, in Gates's terms, the absence presence of the framework into new objects of knowledge to be examined from the landscape or perspective of the blues people, and therefore from the perspective not of the people as Volk, as in the cultural nationalist aspect of the black aesthetics and black arts movements, but as in the popular aspect of these movements, of the people as the movements of people who logically excluded as, quote, the waste products of all modern political practice, whether capitalist or Marxist, end quote, Leotard citing Grand 1990, with their exclusion from being indispensable to the reproduction of our present order, links up with Fanon's recognition that, quote, black self-alienation, end quote, cannot be detached from the devalorized conception of the human on the purely phylogenic, ontogenic model of natural organism that is defining of the thought as, indeed, of its correlated aesthetics. In, this case of the, in the case of the former, as an episteme, one whose biocentric order of truth calls for the human to be seen as mere mechanisms, and as such, one whose members are all ostensibly naturally diselected by evolution until proven otherwise by his or her or that of his or her population group's success in the bourgeois order of being and of things, quote, The advancement of the welfare of mankind, Darwin wrote at the end of The Descent of Man, It is a most intricate problem. All ought to refrain from marriage who cannot avoid abject poverty for their children. As Mr. Galton has remarked, if the prudent avoid marriage while the reckless marry, the inferior members of society will tend to supplant the better members of society. Against the biocentric eugenicist thought and the absent presence of the bioevolutionary framework or conception of the human, Fanon wrote, What are by common consent called the human sciences have their own drama? Should one postulate a type for human reality and describe its psychic modalities only through deviations from it? Or should one not rather strive unremittently from a concrete and ever new understanding of man? All these inquiries lead only in one direction. To make man admit that he is nothing, absolutely nothing and that he must put an end to the narcissism on which he relies in order to imagine that he is different from the other animals. Having reflected on this, I grasp my narcissism with both hands and turn my back on the degradation of those who make man a mere mechanism.